You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. My guest is Lance Hamsart, an entomologist and senior director of research and development for Hearts Mountain Corporation. We're going to chat about two serious parasites that have been causing disease and mayhem for people and animals for the past 35 to 55 million years, fleas and ticks. For full transparency, I am a paid spokesperson for Hearts. I also have full confidence in their products as being safe and effective when used as directed. So sit, stay, we'll be right back after the short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Do you know that moment when your dirty dog's about to jump in your nice, clean car? You can avoid all the cleanup and mess with a 4K9 seat cover. 4K9 makes heavy-duty seat covers and cargo liners that will blend seamlessly with the interior of your vehicle. You can find us at 4K9s.com. That's the number 4. K-N-I-N-E-S dot com or on Amazon dot com. 4K9 makes nothing but the best for your best friend. Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. Let's talk pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Lance, thank you very much for being with us today. First off, what's an entomologist? Well, an entomologist is someone who has gone to school and studied a specific subject that really relates to insects. That is what an entomologist is. So as a little kid, were you one of those little boys that liked going out and collecting bugs and seeing what they did and how they lived? Uh, I, I certainly was. Growing up, I had more fun looking at them, per se, and finding them than actually collecting them. That didn't come until a little bit later on, but I did have my first larger insect collection in grade school, and then it, they just seemed to get bigger as I went through high school and college and grad school. The bugs or the collections? Both. The bugs are obviously in different sizes. I mean, people know how many different types of insects that they happen to just see crawling around and flying around lights at night and what have you. Some are large, some are small. But when you do an insect collection for an educational requirement, you really do have to collect insects that cover all the different types of insects, which is a tremendous number of different types. There are certainly more types of bugs than any other life form on the earth. Oh, and I believe it with ants. I live in Southern California where I swear one of the homes that I lived on had to be on top of an ant hill because they were everywhere, almost as ubiquitous as fleas and ticks. How did you get involved with research and development for hearts? Because here you are, yes, a bug lover, and now you're turning into a bug controller. Yes. Well, as I went through my uh, undergraduate work and was studying insects and their structure, how they work, how they live, when I went on to graduate school, I I had a specific love for the subject. So I went for my specific degree in entomology in grad school. And as I was uh, going to grad school, I also happened to have a job that was dealing with pesticides of household pests and what have you. And so I gave, got a, a really deep learning of 
pesticides themselves, their chemistry, how they work against the pests and what have you. And uh, when I found the opportunity to come to work for Hearts, it was kind of a double win or actually a triple win for me because one, controlling insect pests, you're really doing a benefit for the people who don't want to have to deal with the bugs. But in the case of, of Hearts Mountain product development, it's not just the people who are happy to get rid of the fleas and ticks, but certainly it's better for the health of the companion animals that they happen to own to get rid of the parasites because they can't really do it themselves. They do need a help, uh, helping hand when the problems do get bad. And you're so right, Lance, because fleas and ticks are just devastating. I had this very sad situation, a mature woman, I'm surrounded by a retirement community in my practice, and this woman brought in this small little Yorkie, she said it was just off for a few days, he didn't really think too much of it, saw it, and this poor little sweetheart was just laying on its side, hardly moving at all, flipped its lip to take a look, and instead of being that nice pink color, it was white. Mm -hmm. And you could have a cute little haircut and, you know, had the bow in its hair and everything. You could tell she loved this pet dearly. And I looked at the coat and it was just crawling with fleas. So this dog literally was being sucked dry with fleas. And sometimes people just don't realize the consequences of not controlling these parasites. You know, they want to be natural and they don't want to do anything. It's like, that's not going to always work for us. Before we get there, and we definitely want to talk about the old-fashioned parasiticides and then the way that we're now controlling them. Tell us a little bit about fleas and ticks. Oftentimes people think they're kind of like one in the same. What's the difference? What's their similarities? Well, first, fleas are insects. So I had a chance to learn quite a bit about fleas all through my college days. Ticks are different. They're actually a cousin to the spider. So how they're different, one, their structure is completely different. Insects typically have six legs. Ticks, in particular, the adult ticks actually have eight, just like a spider. Insects have a distinct three different segments to their body, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, where a tick really only has two. It's got a head area and an abdomen area. So they're structurally different. Fleas are very, very tiny, very, very small, head of, head of a pin, and are flattened from side to side. They're straight up and down, very, very thin. That allows them to crawl through the fur so effectively. Because mm, they just fly through the fur. Sometimes it's hard Oh, to see. they do. They do. If you were to look at a flea under a microscope, you could see these huge teeth almost, like on their head and on their legs and what have you, which actually are used to help propel themselves through the fur. And because they're so thin, they do get through the fur very quickly. Ticks are uh, completely almost the opposite. They're great big fat things compared to fleas. And they have front legs on them. If you ever find a tick, the front legs really are kind of hard to see. But down in a small size, when it comes to an animal's fur, those front legs are specially designed to hang on. And that's how animals pick up ticks, because they walk through tall grasses, brush and what have you. And the ticks are just waiting there with their arms out, and they latch on. And that's how ticks get onto animals as well as you. Fleas, differently, they're not waiting on bushes waiting for somebody to come by. Fleas are hanging down in the soil, in leaf, in grassy areas, or in the carpeting in your home. And when you walk over that carpet, they jump straight up in the air and latch on to whatever host, be it an animal, or you, that happens to be walking by, and their sole goal, just like ticks, is to take a blood meal. Uh, I was reading someplace that a flea could jump vertically, straight up and down, something like eight feet. That's huge for that little body. Well, that would be absolutely huge. Actually, the number really is about 11 inches. Oh, all right. Uh, In the laboratory, oh, it's incredibly high when you consider how small a flea is. It's the equivalent of a human jumping straight up a hundred floors. So imagine yourself sitting at the bottom of a of, on a street in front of a whole great big huge hotel that goes up a hundred floors. Imagine just being able to jump up and land on the roof. That's how far a flea can jump. And now both of these are blood suckers. How much blood? Because you know here was that little dog, all of five pounds, who was literally being sucked dry, and people are just amazed. How can this happen? How much blood does a flea or a tick ingest? 
Well, the amount that an individual flea or tick ingests is not really the issue. The issue is how much fleas, plural, can ingest. And that goes to the point, that story that you were talking about, about how an animal had had so many different amounts, a number of fleas on it, that it was so much that all of those fleas were sufficient to be able to draw enough blood from that pet to actually make it sick. That is what the true issue is. An individual flea really does not take too much. Think of how large a flea is, like the head of a pin, and it will consume a good 20, 30 percent of its weight in blood. You put hundreds of fleas on a pet, which is not uncommon in an infested area, and you have an awful lot of blood that's coming out. A tick is a little bit more interesting. It takes a blood meal, and initially it uh, just uh, attaches and kind of sits there for a while. Then it starts to feed, and it will engorge itself. It will blow up like a balloon, and its abdomen is structured in such a way so that it can just keep drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking. So a tick will increase its size, several times to a point where it may have started about the size of a half of a pea for a certain type of species, and it could end up looking like a grape. That's how much blood it can ingest. The, the, amount, of blood that a, yeah, the amount of blood that a tick takes, though, the really dangerous aspect is not so much how blood, much blood it takes, but while it feeds, it's actually regurgitating some blood back into its host, and that's how diseases get spread. That's moderately disgusting. So it's vomiting back into the host. That is correct. Charming. Now, there's so many things to talk about, which people and myself, you know, always find, I think, fascinating and scary. Ticks in Southern California, we have some. We don't see a lot. Are ticks worldwide? Yes, they are worldwide. There are different types of species which are kind of located in different areas. If you were to look at the, a map of the United States, the brown dog tick is from east to west and from south to north. The whole country, brown dog ticks can be found. In the case of the deer tick, the kind that spreads Lyme disease, it started out in the northeast, but it actually has been able to spread now across the northern tier of the United States. And they also have a population that's over on the west coast in the north, Washington and Oregon. It looks a little different. They call them the black-legged tick, but actually they're like a sister cousin to the same deer tick that's on the east coast. Then you've got the Gulf Coast tick, which is down by, uh, by Texas, and the American dog tick, which is typically in the northern tier and well up into Canada. So depending on the environment, you can have different ticks. And will a tick just, you're talking about deer ticks and dog ticks, they'll get on other species, they'll get on us, so they seem to be a rather indiscriminate feeder, but they have preferences? The preference, really, as far as I have been able to see and hear through research and what have you, is if they have an ability to get onto a host and the host is unable to knock it off, you will have brown dog ticks that feed on dogs, they'll feed on cats, They'll feed on humans, and just about the same thing for any of those other ticks that I mentioned. Humans aren't going to be as easily attached to because we don't have the fur that a dog or a cat has where it can actually embed itself down in and not be seen. So you're going to find if you're walking through, humans certainly can pick up ticks through fields and what have you, but because they have clothes on and what have you, sometimes the ticks don't have a chance to get to the skin. Or people can feel a tick crawling around on its skin versus a tick that isn't really going to be felt by animals when they're just walking on the first all that much. I would not say that they are uh, specific, those species that I talked about. There are other types of ticks called soft body ticks that do not get on dogs and cats and humans, but they are primarily bird parasites. And they're just as much problems for birds as those other ticks were for humans and pets. My guest right now is Lance Hemsarth. He is a Senior Director of Research and Development for Hearts Mountain Corporation. I was watching a movie the other day uh, called The Physician, has Ben Kingsley in it. And this was the 11th century where an Englishman went to Persia to learn how to become a physician. And they had an outbreak there. One kingdom was trying to invade another one and decimate their numbers and sent in the sick person who had this black 
plague, Black Death. And what was fascinating as all these people are dying, hundreds and hundreds of people are dying in this walled off community because they were kept in there. They didn't want them to spread. One of the physicians found, gee, look at all these dead bodies. The person dies and the fleas are leaving the body. So this was the Black Plague. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And correct me if I'm wrong, Black Plague is still around even these days. It is. And uh, you don't have to consider that something like that would only take place in areas that are um, remote and what have you. The bubonic plague is present and being found, uh, diagnosed in the United States every year. Uh, That is absolutely scary that here is this disease that's still around from the 11th century with all our knowledge, all our medicines, is still causing human loss. It is. Now, to to be clear, the bubonic plague is not something that's raging in the United States. There are a few cases here and there, and thank heavens, antibiotics can handle and deal with the plague very, very effectively. Of course, back in the 1100s, there were no antibiotics, and that's the reason it decimated a large portion of the population that was living that time and throughout Europe. Well, my guest, Lance Hemsarth, is making all of our skins crawl a bit, thought of all of these bugs that are out there, insects that are out there, and other parasites. We're going to be right back after this short break, learning how we can control these creatures so they're not going to bother people and they're not going to bother our pets. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Amazing Pet Expos is coming to a city near you. Admission is always free and your pet is welcome. Shopping, adoptions, free nail trims, discounted shots and microchipping, agility, a pet costume contest, and much more. Plus, meet the guys from Animal Planet's hit TV series Tank and Pit Boss online at AmazingPetExpos.com. Bring your pets to the Pet Expo. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Lance, I find this absolutely fascinating that we have these insects that have been affecting human and people for so many years that we really have gotten better through advances in pharmacology and chemistry. At the top of the show, you were talking about insecticides And now we've really gotten away from that in some respects. How are things different as as we're trying to control parasites now? Well, we've come a long way in first studying fleas and ticks in particular. We're understanding their life cycle. We are understanding their behavior. And so it's not just a pesticide that you just would distribute out without much care of anything else that's around you. We have become very, very targeted in the way in which we take care of parasites on pets in particular. The application, the most common application out there right now, has found great success in being able to control populations of fleas and ticks on animals is through the topical drops. Those topical drops have active ingredients that are at levels that will provide effective control for both fleas and ticks, but they're at such low levels that there is no effect noted. They're relatively safe to use on companion animals, yet those materials, when they are applied, can provide protection against fleas and ticks in general for a full month. Certain products actually can last a little bit longer, but we've come a long way 
And one of the, the really interesting aspects of how these topicals work is when you apply them to your pet, you know, right behind the neck or in a stripe down the back, these insecticides, these pesticides move across the skin and mix with the oils that are in the skin and provide a very, 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 very small residue of pesticide along the skin of the animal underneath the fur such that if a flea jumps on and they come in contact with that little tiny bit that might be on the skin, it's enough to kill the flea, but it has no effect on the companion animal. And it's likewise with ticks. Once they grab on from a bush, they grab onto the fur. When they start to try and climb down into the fur, down to the skin, that's when they pick up a lethal dose, and that provides control for ticks as well. Also, Somebody the active might... ingredients that are being used today mm -hmm. are becoming more and more safe, being selective. And by that, I mean less activity, even in high concentration, less activity to other species, but more active, significantly more active against the parasites. That's the real concern so many of my clients have. They say, I don't want to have something that is toxic in my home. I have children. I just don't want this, so I'm not going to do anything. And that doesn't seem to be the smartest move. No, it is not. Because if you look at these products, these products are to kill fleas and ticks. But you really should look at them just as if your pet were to pick up a germ and needed to go to the veterinarian and have antibiotics that are used to correct an infection. You really can look at it exactly the same way. These products are being used for one thing, and it's to control the parasite and tick without causing the harm to the animals that the products are applied to. And one of the other things that just drives me crazy, again, I'm in Southern California. I'll have a, a well dog, well cat checkup going on, and I'll always ask, so what type of parasite controller are using? What type of preventive? And they'll say, doesn't have any fleas. I've, I've never had fleas. I'm not going to use anything. I would love to have your opinion being an entomologist and knowing these insects, these parasites so well, fleas and ticks. When is the best time to apply flea control? And do you have to do it year round? Because it can get expensive after a while. If you are in an area where fleas and ticks exist, and I'm not too sure there are too many places in the United States where they don't exist. Maybe not all species exist in different parts of the country, but some species exist. Fleas have been able to live in incredibly diverse environments. So the chances of you coming in contact with a flea or tick may be less likely than it would be for a pet who, one, is a whole lot closer to the ground, two, likes to walk around and forage and smell and, and explore in areas. And the more an animal does that, the better chance they're going to have in picking up a parasite. So the easy and quick answer is if the pet is outdoors and is walking around and foraging around, the pesticide application should be taking place during that whole period of time. I look at it like putting on sunscreen. If you're going to go out in the sun, you better put sunscreen on. Whether you're, I've had pretty bad sunburns being way north up in Canada, as well as being in Florida. You have the potential of picking up parasites in the same geographical areas. If someone, if one of your, your listeners is up in uh, Canada and it's in the middle of winter, cold weather outdoors, it will absolutely slow down and stop parasites from trying to get on you. That's when they're outdoors. The question is, what might you have indoors? There are actually tick infestations indoors in Canada. Because of the nation, they've acclimated themselves to these different environments. Fleas nationwide can exist in the home all year long. So to look and think, all right, I'm going to take a chance. Ah, you know, it's kind of wintertime, it's cold, the animal doesn't go out as much, and it is cold, so there aren't any more bugs, I don't see any bugs flying around. I'm going to take a chance and not put it on. I say, you know, why take a chance? If that pet happens to go out on a nice, warm, sunny day in the middle of winter, and it's warm enough to get above 40, 50 degrees, which isn't hard to do 
when you have a protected area that an animal might like to walk into and lay down on a nice warm winter day, it's very easy to pick up parasites. So I would highly recommend if you have a pet and you want to protect it from parasites, use it year long. Well, especially saying that they're in the house. I mean, that's just, I can imagine them in the walls, in the carpet. And we know that those fleas are definitely down into the carpets. Year-round protection, because once the flea, once that tick is in the house, it can be hellacious trying to get rid of them. But people oftentimes, I would love to have you address this. They say, if there was a flea in the house... I would know it because they would jump on me and chew on me, and I'm not getting any bites. Why is that so? If you are in a home, if, if I understand, I apologize, if I understand your question, if you're in the home and you happen to have one flea that jumps up, you might not think you have much of a problem. The issue is you had one flea jump. A flea infestation is not just the adult flea that jumps. A flea infestation, especially in the home, is made up of flea eggs, it's made of flea larvae, like caterpillars, little tiny caterpillars, of the pupae or the cocoon stage, and the adult. Actually, the flea goes through the same stages as the butterfly does, from egg to caterpillar to cocoon to adult. You will not see and ever know that you've got eggs and larvae and pupae in your home. You'll never know it. They're too small, they weigh down inside, typically in the carpet. And you can't just vacuum them up? You can vacuum up, and there is some degree of removal, in particular to the adults. Unfortunately, a flea infestation is typically 5% adults, 10% pupae, 35% larvae, and 50% eggs. Mm. The chance of you being able to pull up all of the eggs and all of the larvae and all of the pupae is virtually nil. So all of those living forms that are down in the carpet are just going to keep right on going. Even though you're vacuuming, you're not going to get them up. Now, you'll probably be able to extract a lot of the adults, but if you stop vacuuming and let them go for a while, all those fleas that were in the cocoon stage, you walk across the carpet, and they're going to be jumping straight up in the air. And that's what's so insidious about a flea infestation. People, once they get to the point and they notice that they happen to have a flea, it's already too late. Fleas on a pet... They may have well just picked it up from outdoors. But if you have a flea on you in the home, it came from your home, had a very good chance of it coming from your home. And if that's the case, you have an infestation in a home. 5% of a population is adults. 95% of a population you don't know you have. Oh, that is just horrid. And again, ticks can be there usually on the pet, but can be in the environment. I'd love to have you talk also just quickly about when you find a tick, people want to immediately remove it. There's all sorts of different ways of turning left, turning right, using a match, using nail polish. Why it's so important not to touch it with your fingers And is it really the head that becomes embedded under the skin? There's so much mythology out there about that. Yeah. And really, this goes to an awful lot that has been learned in research over the past 20, 30 years, I would say at least. When a tick bites, one, it has a little anesthetic in its mouth, so you don't even feel it biting you. Its mouth parts are barbed, and as they move into the skin, those barbs, you know, hold it in the skin, which is actually very, very good. And they will bury their mouth parts right down to the base of their head. It may look as if their head is under the skin, but it really isn't. It's just its mouth parts. When it starts to feed, it will be ingesting blood. The disease transmission that can take place is when they regurgitate, and they do regurgitate as they are feeding. But one of the easiest ways to cause a release of pathogens from a tick into the human is by someone grabbing it and trying to pull it out. Because the first response is, I'm going to grab this tick because I can see it there. They're easy to grab and pull it straight out. Well, the motion of grabbing it and holding it tight enough to pull it out, what are you doing? You're actually squeezing it. So you can almost look as if it's a dropper and you're actually squeezing the dropper and pushing something into the skin. So anyone who happens to have a tick embedded in them, do not grab it with your fingers. 
if you do not have, you can go to the store and buy these little tiny, tiny, tiny pieces of plastic with a little slit in them that allows you to sneak in underneath the head and just have that slit grab the mouth parts to pull it out. They work very, very nicely, and you can get in there and get it out. Sometimes you might even end up leaving some of the mouth parts in you, so you want to be careful. You could get an infection. First and foremost, you don't want to squeeze the tick. Don't light it up with a match. Don't ever do that. That's not going to do anybody any good. Well, certainly won't do the tick any good, but it's not going to do your pet or yourself any good whatsoever trying to do that. So just being very, very careful. If you have a tick in you and it, you are able to extract it, save it and bring it to your vet, bring it to your doctor. You can put it into some cellophane tape, seal it around the edges so it can't get out, bring it in, because any of those ticks that I mentioned, the Gulf Coast, the, there's the Lone Star tick, there's the deer tick, the black-legged tick, the brown dog tick, they all can carry disease. So you don't want to take a chance with your pet or with yourself. Take it into the doctor. They can have it tested and you'll know right away whether or not you need to have some medication. Very good information. Thank you very much, Lentz. Here's one last thing. It's important, depending on where you live, and it sounds like really most people should be using flea control no matter if you're in a city, you're in a suburb area, you're a rural location, on a year-round basis. People love their pets, but sometimes the economy is such, uh, I just really can't afford going to my veterinarian and buying whatever they're recommending. So getting over-the-counter products, Hearts Mountain has been around for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Their products really are very good. Tell us a little bit about the research that you're involved with and why it is okay, it is good to use an over-the-counter product such as Hearts when you read the directions. Absolutely. And what you just said sums it right up. Always, always, always read the directions. If you are getting a product, Pleotic product from the veterinarian, read the label. If you are purchasing it on your own through a retail outlet, read the directions. The directions are there for a reason, so that people can use them correctly and they understand what it is that the product is going to provide. What Hearts has done and is continuing to do is do research into the very best formulas using the best selective active ingredients to provide effective and safe control of parasites on pets. If any company is selling a parasite product, whether it's a parasite product that's sold through the vets or a parasite product that's sold through the retail, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, must approve that product for it to be sold. In order for it to be sold, in order for the EPA to approve it, it has to be evaluated for safety and performance. Just like the FDA has to approve medicines to give people or pets, the EPA evaluates the same types of testing data to make sure that the product is efficacious and safe to use. So that when you see on a label that it is acceptable for use on the market for fleas and ticks, know that the company has gone to the extent of making sure the EPA has seen all of the data, have reviewed it, and found it acceptable to do what it says on the label. And that's what Hearts has been doing, and that's what Hearts is continuing to do. There's an awful lot of research out there, and we're continuing to learn. Research being done by the industry, research being done by universities, research being done by the veterinarian community. And we're all focusing on the same thing. How can we do things better? Hart's goal is to have products on the marketplace that can be used easily, that the labels can be understood, and that pets can be protected. And absolutely every one of the Hart's products that can be sold on the marketplace has met the rigorous requirements that the EPA has for parasite control, We make sure we have all of the data that we need to, and the EPA has found it acceptable. That's what we've done, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Lance, one of the things I love about the Hearts packaging is that it will tell you which species to put it on, the size of the pet, and what I especially love so many times in very heartbreaking results. People will use a product that is meant for a dog. Oh, I'll just put a drop or two 
on a cat. And a cat is not a little dog. So the heart's packaging has right on there a kitty with that little international no sign through it going, no, do not put this on your cat. That's correct. When, unfortunately, there have been problems, it is many times that consumers have used a product that's meant for a dog and put on a cat. Just like if there's a medication that's to go on an adult, you don't turn around and put that same medication the same way on a child. You just don't do it. These types of products are meant to do what they do and say on the label. And cats in particular can be very, very sensitive. That is the reason why we formulate the formulas that we do specifically for use on cats so that we know that cats are not going to have a problem. And anyone who thinks just because a cat might be smaller than their dog and, oh, I'll use three quarters of the tube on my dog and the last quarter I'll put on the cat. No, that can be a very, very terrible thing to do for the cat because if the product was meant for a dog, you could be hurting your cat by doing that. So that's, again, why it's so important to read the label. If it's meant for a dog, you put it on a dog and you don't put it on anything else. If it's meant for a cat, put it on a cat. Don't put it on anything else. Consider it that the government is telling you, don't do something, then you really shouldn't do it. Les Hemsarth, I do appreciate you being with us today. You've given us just wonderful information, made my skin crawl a bit, but okay, it's wonderful information. If people wanted to learn more about the Hearts product, where should they go? Hearts.com. You can certainly go right on the, uh, the internet. We have a, a website that's going to help you through information about our products how they're to be used. We'll talk about the parasites so you get a better understanding of what they're, uh, what these parasites are all about. You certainly can uh, find all sorts of really great helpful information on our website. Great. Well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate you being with us today. We've learned a lot. And know that, yes, this is a year-round issue, year-round control. Keep that bond protected between you and your pet. So this is Dr. Bernadine Cruz. You've been listening to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. Please tune in again next week. We'll have more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. Thanks for listening. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.